Hi and welcome to Holland Tech Week. My name is Sarah Nielsen and I'm from High Five. Today I will be welcoming you to this last session of Holland Tech Week, which will be focusing on blockchain. The purpose of Holland Tech Week is to inspire all of your entrepreneurs, students and employees out there, what tech is and could be in the future, and hopefully help you figure out how you can be a part of creating that future. This session will be focusing on blockchain and how it could be used to track water usage and re realize how much water we actually use to produce groceries and so on, and help us use less of it in the future to save the world. To tell us more about this is Lisa Klug. <laughs> She's a student from Hamster University in Industrial Management and Innovation. And she will tell us all about blockchain, this hard to grasp uh, area, and hopefully make us understand how we can use it. So Lisa, the stage is yours. Help us understand and how we can save the world with blockchain. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Okay. We will talk about blockchain for sustainable water management. And um, the region where I come from looks like this. I'm from Germany. Um, it's the region called Bergisches Land. And there we have a lot of water. So all my life I was never questioning actually the accessibility of water. And um, that changed a little bit when I um, went to South Africa. Because 2017 I had the chance to study there for a while. And um, and that time, Cape Town had a big problem with water. They had a little water crisis, or actually a big water crisis, because um, the water was becoming more scarce. They have several reservoirs that provide the city with water. And um, this is the biggest one. It uh, provides the water for 50% of the city. And uh, in this picture, you see how it looked like in 2014. But then it w um, there was a problem because it didn't rain as much anymore. And um, also the population was growing. So actually the water in this reservoir was reduced to this amount. So from full capacity to only 12%. Um, this was in 2018 then. So Cape Town, they actually calculated a day zero when they would have to turn off the water there and you wouldn't get water out of the tap anymore. Luckily, they um, had some measures that helped them um, to improve the situation again. So they, the habitants had to save a lot of water. This is what I also felt when I was there. And uh, also they um, found new ways to access the water. So um, luckily, we can say in the last moment, um, they, got, um, they could improve it. And uh, it didn't come to this day zero. But um, analysts estimated that it had um, 300,000 people had lost their job due to this crisis in these four years. And um, also the water prices increased there. They doubled within four years. So um, experts agree that Cape Town is actually just the beginning and that um, we will have this problem in other cities as well. For example, in uh, Sao Paulo, they had a similar situation in 2015. And also uh, Beijing, Moscow, Cairo and uh, Mexico City have similar problems. On uh, this picture, you see the global water withdrawals from 1900 to 2010. And um, within a period of 100 years, the global freshwater use has been increased by um, times six. Actually, in this picture, the, you see that the biggest, amount of the biggest amount of water is used for agriculture. So 69% um, of the global water withdrawals are used for agriculture. Um, this growth um, can be mainly attributed to population growth, economic development and uh, shifting consumption patterns. So now um, experts think about how it will be in the future and how this scenario will continue. There are um, several trends. One group of experts say that uh, in 2030, that's in nine years, we will have a water deficit of 40% uh, already. And the OECD projected that uh, the demand would increase by 55% between uh, 2000 and 2050. 
So how it will be in the future, that remains uncertain. But uh, experts are quite sure that will be, there will be increased competition about water, um, and especially water in agriculture. Um, this will also uh, affect the gross domestic product. In this picture, you see the GDP in uh, 2050, if we in keep the business as usual or if we adopt more efficient water policies. And you see here that uh, some countries will face a loss between 2%, um, a lot 6% uh, and also until uh, up to 10%. So um, it's also a lot of economic... Um, um, it will affect the economy as well, this water scarcity. Now we may think that uh, this is a problem that is somewhere else, but not in Sweden. But uh, also in Sweden we see already the water prices increasing. So uh, between 2014 and 2019, the um, price of the water and wastewater has been increased by 14%. Um, but the general price trend was only at uh, 6%. So uh, we see that the water is getting um, more expensive. And um, this is because the um, infrastructure needs to be adapted to the climate change and um, also yeah, to the climate change because there will be uh, more cases of acute water shortages and also flooding, so it needs to be modernized and uh, somebody has to uh, pay this modernization. Now, there has been an um, article in Dagens Industrie, that's a Swedish financial newspaper, and uh, they said that cooperation is needed to tackle this water issue. So there were um, senior representatives from H&M, AstraZeneca, Gina, Trico and Electrolux. And they said, um, with an increasingly acute global water crisis looming, we would like to call on more Swedish companies to actively engage in responsible water management along their value chains and to work with investors and other companies on this issue. Now we will go a bit deeper into the um, agriculture and the water use in the food industry. Um, here you can see how much liter of water we need to produce one kilogram of the product. You can see that uh, for beef, we are at over 15,000 liters of water for just one kilogram. So imagine you go out for dinner with your family or with your friends and uh, within one evening, one meal, uh, you have used 15,000 liters of water because you together you ate uh, one kilogram of beef. Um, you can see that it's um, a lot in the meat industry where the water is consumed. Also for butter, we need a lot of water. Um, and what you can also see is that we have different categories of water that are considered in this water footprint. So we have green water, blue water and grey water. The green one, this is the water um, that we have in the floor or that comes from the rain. So actually, um, for example, that's the water that plants get when they stand outside and it's raining. Um, if we want to save water, we can't do so much about uh, this green part of the water. Um, I mean, we can uh, change, uh, make changes in what we eat and eat more plants, um, for example, but we can't uh, change so much about the green water. But what we can uh, change is the blue and the grey water. So the blue water is the groundwater or surface water that is um, extracted and used for artificial irrigation and it's not returned to a water body. And then we have the grey water. This is the one that is uh, contamined during production and uh, the amount of water that would be required to restore the water to an acceptable quality. So now we can work on the blue and the grey water. And if we look on the same uh, picture as before, but only on the blue and grey parts, this is how the picture turns out. So still for um, pig meat, we need over a thousand liters um, to produce one kilogram of pork. Um, for the meat industry, um, a large amount of the water is used for the feed for the animals, so actually to grow plants that the animals can eat then. 
how could this uh, supply chain now look like? Um, we will take it with an example of the um, pork or pig meat supply chain. Um, so we have the um, global average water footprint of 6,000 liters. Um, we must say that in Sweden it's probably a bit, little bit lower um, the number than this global average. But um, we can now just allocate it to the different steps of the production process. And um, the goal is to make it transparent. How much water do we use in which of the processes or in which of the steps? Um, this is how it could look like in the supermarket then. then. Imagine you as a customer, um, you go grocery shopping and uh, you get a transparent information of how much water um, has been used to produce this product. And um, then as a consumer, you can take this into consideration when you buy your product. And um, you can think about, do I want um, to have maybe a cheaper product, but that has uh, been produced with a lot of water, or a product that might be a little bit more expensive, but where less water has been used. I talked to a lot of people about this uh, idea of making this water consumption transparent and uh, all of them agreed that they would love to have more information about the um, products they buy and um, more transparency about uh, how this whole pro uh, process actually works. So what are the benefits now for the stakeholders or for the actors in this uh, supply chain? First of all, we as consumers, we are getting more environmentally conscious and um, we want to make a sustainable purchase decision. Then we have the retailer who wants to fulfill the customer wishes. And then uh, this might already create a bit of a pressure in the <laughs> meat industry, um, but also the slaughter and the meat processor, they uh, want to react to the, to the rising um, water prices and um, they probably also strive to meet the sustainable development goals and um, improve their corporate social responsibility. Now the question is, how do we get there? How do we get these numbers in the process? And if we break it down, it's actually two steps. First of all, we need to measure the water consumption and uh, then we need to make the water consumption transparent. This first step, um, I think in some parts it's quite easy to measure the water consumption. Uh, for example, for my thesis I've been working with Lagerforce and um, they create um, cleaning equipment for the food production. So um, they have already systems that measure the water consumption and the use of chemicals in this industry. So um, there we have already the um, values of how much water is used. In other parts of the supply chain, it might be more difficult if we think about the farmers that uh, grow the food for the pork, for example. There it gets a bit tricky to uh, get the values and measure the water consumption. Then in the second step, we uh, need to make the water consumption transparent. In this example, uh, we have a jam factory instead of a pork meat factory. <laughs> and um, there, we actually just need to collect the values that we measured in the first step. So we can say in the first step where the strawberries are washed, uh, we use 2.7 liters of water. And then we sum it up over the whole process. And in the second step, it has been 4.8. And then in the last step, 1.4. And um, in the end then, we can create a label and say, uh, for this lot of strawberry jam, we have used 8.9 liters of water. So actually, what we need now is a database to uh, collect these values. But what kind of database is useful for this? I would say, uh, first of all, we need one that is digital. And it should also be decentral because we have several actors that uh, work together in the supply chain and um, they should all be able to easily access this um, database. Then it should be transparent for all the actors and um, it should also update real time. Now, um, the next point is that it should operate trustless because in the supply chain we might have a big 
um, network with a lot of actors, but they don't necessarily know each other and they also don't necessarily trust each other. So um, it's important that the technology itself provides this trust. And it should be tamper-proof. It should not be possible to um, change the values that we put in the database. So afterwards, no one should be able to actually reduce the water consumption um, a little bit and uh, make it lower than it actually was. Now you can take a guess which kind of database uh, <laughs> might be useful here. <laughs> Yeah, it's the blockchain. <laughs> so um, I will make a short introduction in what blockchain is. I know that uh, some of you might be experts in blockchain, others didn't have uh, heard of blockchain before. So I will keep it at a um, quite high level and um, just explain some basics. So to understand the blockchain, it helps to think of it um, as a group chat. We have here the example of uh, Johannes, Maya and Anna, and they want to go to the bar tonight. And Johannes suggests um, that they go at 6 p.m. Now, this chat is stored on each phone. So um, Johanna, Maya and Anna, they all have this um, chat history on their phone. Now, Anna changes her mind and she doesn't want to meet at 6 p.m., but uh, 8 p.m. would be better for her. But she can't take this decision on her own. Um, she also can't just change the information in the chat. She can't go and uh, change the number that uh, Johannes wrote already. But she needs to agree with the others and um, either sh they have to plan from the beginning or she stands alone at the bar at 8 p.m. So no one can change anything afterwards. This is actually the basic principle of uh, the blockchain and one of the most important things there. And um, in the blockchain as well, the information is um, stored in a history. We have now in the blockchain the case that uh, each piece of information is uh, stored in a block. And then we have a hash. This is kind of a digital fingerprint for each block. Um, that is calculated and it also contains information about the previous block. So this is how this whole chain is linked together, through these hashes, which are like fingerprints. So similar to our chat, the information cannot be changed. Because if we now um, change one information here, the hash values, they change as well. And then our chain is disconnected, it doesn't work anymore because we would have to recalculate all the other um, hashes again to make this chain work again. So, as Anna and her friends would have to um, replan in the group chat, here we would have to recalculate all the chain. Um, and in the chat, that's maybe not such a problem, but in the blockchain, it's not that easy. Because in the blockchain, we work with a decentralized network. So, centralized network, this is when we have one person in the middle um, who is controlling all the network and is connected to all the other nodes. But decentralized, um, there we are maybe connected to one or two of the other nodes, but um, not to all of the nodes. Now, each member of this network, um, they all have an own copy of the chain on their computer. And um, the computer always checks if the chain is still intact and if the hash values are okay. Um, a new block of information is only added to the chain if all the other members in the network agreed and said, all right, this block is okay and we can add it. And, um, but it's not the not a person who sits there, but it's the um, blockchain itself. So the um, computer who does this verification and uh, secures the blockchain. And um, this is actually what is so special about the blockchain. So um, the control and uh, the trust, they are um, enabled technically by the blockchain. Um, now you might wonder about the connection of Bitcoin and blockchain. 
um, Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency, is just one application of blockchain. But you can do a lot more with blockchain, like our example um, with um, information in the supply chain. Also, you might have heard that um, Bitcoin has a really high energy consumption. This is not the case for every blockchain. There are other types of blockchain that don't use a lot of energy. So um, for our example uh, with the supply chain, we would not have this problem with um, high energy consumption. Now, the question that I worked on doing my master thesis was, uh, what makes the blockchain adoption so difficult now? And um, why do companies not um, adopt it yet widely? Because it's such a nice technology with so much potential. But what prevents the companies from uh, adopting blockchain? And there are actually four categories of barriers. These are technological, organizational, and environmental. In the technological barriers, we have things like um, um, the knowledge that the company has about blockchain. So maybe they um, don't have the right knowledge yet about the technology. Um, or um, they also might have a negative perception towards blockchain because of the connection to Bitcoin. Then we have organizational barriers. These are barriers um, like lack of management support in this process of adoption. For the environmental barriers, um, we have supply chain barriers and external barriers. So supply chain are the ones um, where we work together with our actors in the network. And there can be issues like uh, communication and um, organizing this um, project. And uh, in the external barriers, this is all about um, the stakeholders that are external to the supply chain network, like um, the government, for example. Maybe they have regulations um, that make it more difficult to adopt the technology. Now, when I started with my thesis, I thought that, uh, that the technological barriers um, are the most difficult ones because, I mean, blockchain is um, not so easy to understand in the first place. So I thought this is probably um, what makes it so difficult. But it turned out that it was not the case. And um, actually, the supply chain barriers are the ones that are the most difficult. We have uh, five different supply chain barriers. Um, first of all, that's the lack of customers' awareness and tendency about sustainability and blockchain. Then we have the problems in collaboration and communication and coordination. So um, the whole issue about organizing this project. Then we have um, the challenge of information disclosure. So um, the, when you start adopting blockchain, there are discussions about what kind of information do we put on the chain and what kind of information is transparent. Um, then it's challenging to integrate sustainable practices and blockchain through the supply chain. And also there might be cultural differences of supply chain partners. Now the question is, uh, how do we overcome these barriers and how can we help companies to adopt blockchain? And uh, the first thing that we can do is what we are doing today, uh, talking about it and um, communicating this idea. So um, it's good to um, show maybe use cases of how blockchain could work or um, concrete cases about um, the sustainable water management, for example. How could it work there? How could we implement it? And then there are also um, a few examples already where blockchain has been implemented in the food industry. And um, this is great to communicate it, uh, just to show examples. Then um, the second point could be a collaborative ecosystem of companies that want to adopt blockchain. I think um, this is where, um, where High Five does a great job, just to bring together different people that have this interest and um, connect them. And um, then the third point is once that a project is started, it's about uh, the concrete organization of this project and um, setting up the project structure to overcome especially the second problem of uh, the collaboration and uh, coordination in the supply chain. Now, how nice it would it be if uh, in the future, when we go to the supermarket, we have this label on the products and we actually have a transparent process and um, know about the water consumption in this process. 
And also, we can be sure that we can trust the number of this product because uh, there's a blockchain behind that uh, makes sure that actually the right, re right values are communicated. I think we would have a lot of uh, happy customers there. <laughs> But also for the companies, it's good. It's good because um, they don't only contribute to um, reaching the sustainable development goals, but also um, they react to this water crisis and the economic um, um, consequences of this <laughs> of this water crisis. And. Um, here in Holland, there has been a water collaboration um, project initiated where several companies explore this opportunity. I think it's a really great project. Um, I've been uh, working a bit with it during my thesis and I would be super happy if this project continues and if um, the stakeholders um, commit to contribute in this project. And uh, once we have proven in Holland that this solution works, we could also scale it up and uh, then take it global and make sure that um, we use the available water that we have in uh, the most efficient way. Thanks a lot. So, do we have any questions for Lisa from the audience? For me, I think it was very, very eye-opening to see how much water we actually use, uh, because that was mind-blowing. <laughs> uh, so I think for me, personally, just seeing that when I buy it, that would help me a lot. Um, we have discussed uh, blockchain and the use of it. What? Uh, Besides, uh, for the companies, uh, how do you think customers, do they have to know that it is blockchain that has been used uh, to just see the water usage or is that just part of the deal? I think for them, for them it's important to know that they can trust the values. It's not important to know how it works in the background and I think it will be difficult to uh, communicate how in the background this all works. But uh, the important point is that um, the values that are on the products are trustworthy and uh, that these are the actual values that have been um, yeah, used during the supply chain. Yeah. And I think that is one important part that uh, when we talked about it before, that you don't actually have to know what blockchain is. You just have to know that you can trust it. Uh, just you have the example of, okay, you can use the light switch, but can you describe how the lights actually get there? I can't, but I can <laughs> still use the light switch and I trust the light switch that it will work. Uh, and I think that is a really important part with blockchain as well. We don't have to understand it. We just have to trust that it does what it's supposed to do. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation. And I hope that everyone out there got a <laughs> bit more knowledge about the blockchain and about water usage. And hopefully you will be a part of making sure that this happens. Yes, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And this sums up all of Holland Tech Week. The week is over for this year, but we will continue with Holland Tech Meet. So keep an eye out on hollandtech.se for more. And oh, we got questions. I'm not wrapping it up. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anna. Do you think that this kind of solution can be useful to establish how much water do we consume at home? Then will we have a value to compare with the food production? Um, I think it can be used um, at home as well. Um, if we have the right sensors at home, so um, maybe at home it will be a bit more difficult to break it up for which activity we use how much water. Um, but uh, for sure it would be interesting to get these values and um, to make people more aware of the water consumption. Thank you. Great. I'm so glad that we got and I see it is one more question from the physical audience. Uh, so if we can just uh, pass the mic over here. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. It's quite easy uh, to ask uh, the most important one. Has this been recorded? 
Yeah. <laughs> so the question was if this has been recorded and for you to know as well. Yes, this is recorded so you can see it over and over and over again. <laughs> we know that blockchain is a hard technology and we would like to get to know it. And we have to do it several times to actually realize that, yeah, it is a technology that we can use for so much. So, no more questions about <laughs> wrapping it up too early. <laughs> Great. Uh, keep an eye out on halantech.se for more in regards of tech in all other areas. And thank you so much for being a part of Halantech Week. See you next year.